last week, we'll remember that the seventh seal has been broken on the scroll of the title deeds of all the earth. And out of the seventh seal proceeded seven trumpets. And these trumpets are sounded one after the other to herald a new series of judgments as God's long-suffering gives way to judgment and justice and wrath. We watched the first four trumpets sound and we studied the consequences that they triggered last week. And we're going to read the whole chapter here before us tonight that we might all be of one mind as we go through the message. So it's Revelation chapter 9, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke, notice that statement, there came out of the smoke, locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth, and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths 
issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by the plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. And we pray again, as Sinclair has been leading us in prayer to pray, that God would give us understanding on the Scriptures tonight, because only God can do that. And we pray that He'll do that for His own glory. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I was saying that the seventh seal has been broken on the scroll of the title deeds of all the earth, and out of the seventh seal proceeded seven trumpets. And these trumpets are sounded one after the other to herald a new series of judgments as God's long-suffering gives way to God's wrath. The first four trumpets sound, and we studied the consequences that they triggered last week. And verse 13, you'll remember, ended with an angel declaring that there's still worse to come. Tonight we have the fifth and the sixth trumpets sounding, and the first two of the three woe judgments occurring, because the last Three trumpet judgments are also known as the three woe judgments. You'll remember that angel said, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And we made it clear that the inhabitants of the earth didn't mean everybody that was on the planet earth because there's 144,000 down there. And there's a multitude which no man could number. But the inhabitants of the earth that's referred to here are those who have closed their hearts completely to God and will never repent. That's who we have in view. We saw that last week. Now, the apostasy of the angel can be seen here in verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. So we can see here, first of all, a fallen star. We learn from the Greek scholars that John did not see a star falling because the tense of the word in the Greek is past tense. And so it should read, I saw a star fallen from heaven. And it wasn't a meteorite that John saw because we see that the star here is a personality in this verse because we're told, and to him was given. So this is a living, intelligent being because the personal pronoun him is ascribed to this character. Now you all know very well by now that the Greek word for star can also be translated angel or messenger. Now, I want you to notice not only his personality, but also his authority, for he has come from heaven to earth. He began in heaven, but he has fallen to earth with a key. In other words, like Peter, who was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven, he has been given authority of some kind. Now, where did he get this key from? From the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in chapter 1 and verse 18, our Lord Jesus is holding the keys. And he said, I am he that liveth 
and was dead. The Lord was really dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So the Lord has the keys of hell and of death. Also, when Christ delivered the Gadarene up there at Galilee, who was possessed by a legion of demons, in Luke's account of the gospel, chapter 8 and verse 31, we read, And they besought, speaking of the demons, and they besought or pleaded with him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And that's the same Greek word for the bottomless pit, or literally in the Greek, the pit of the abyss. And so that's what we're looking at here. The divine power that controls this place is in the hands of the Savior, and the demons knew that. So there's divine permission here. I'm not going to go into this again this evening. You all know it so well, but God has a directive will and it's not lost. You'll find it in the Word of God. But he also has a permissive will. Wasn't it Joseph who said to his brothers who sold him into slavery, you meant it unto me for evil, but God meant it for good. God had a hidden purpose in permitting this to happen. It wasn't God's directive will for those men to sell their brother into slavery, but it was God's permissive will because God was going to bring good out of it. And this fallen angel has the key in God's permissive will. Now look at his activity in verse 2. At the beginning of the verse, he's opening the bottomless pit. It says there in verse 2, we'll read verse 1 first of all, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw an angel fall, or a fallen angel from heaven onto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. John had seen a great furnace in his day, and this is what it reminded him of, the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And so you can see that we can see here his activity, this fallen angel's activity. He's opening the bottomless pit. Now remember, he wasn't sent with this key. He fell from heaven. And that's why it's widely believed that this is the angel Lucifer who fell from heaven and became Satan. You'll remember our Lord Jesus Christ said in Luke Chapter 10 and verse 18, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Christ said, I saw it. Now, before we leave the fallen star, please notice his locality because he has fallen to earth to open the bottomless pit or the abyss, as it's called in Luke 8 and 31. This is a literal place pinpointed by Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 9 as being in, and I quote, the lower parts of the earth. That's where it is, in the lower parts of the earth. Now verse 2 describes a foul smoke. He opened the bottomless pit. There arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. John is standing well back. And he's looking at this scene. And he sees the great swirling clouds of smoke rising into the sky and polluting and darkening the sky so densely that even the sunlight couldn't get through. Even the God-given light that man had is being darkened just now. And oh, how we're reminded of those fearful words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, concerning those who knew the gospel of the grace of God before the rapture, and yet we're told, and I quote, they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, the beast, the Antichrist, 
that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God sends them strong delusion. And God is sending them strong delusion that they all might be damned because they wouldn't believe the truth. But they had pleasure in unrighteousness. They were too busy having a good time. Oh, the mental misery of a satanically poisoned mind. And as we see the smoke of the pit, we can think again of our wonderful Savior saying in Matthew chapter 6, verse 23, at the end of the verse, If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So many today are worshiping God by traditions, by the works of their own hands. And in so many different ways, they think they have the way to heaven. And the light that is in them is darkness, and it's taken them to hell, and they know nothing about it. If only they would read God's infallible word. But we can see not only a fallen star and a foul smoke here, but it's giving way to a fiendish swarm. For as John continues to describe the distant scene before his eyes, in verse 3, he says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. He sees a great swarm of locusts coming out of the smoke-like, the smog-like smoke that had been in the pit. I was reminded of the fog, the smog that you see in Belfast and London and these great cities. And here out of this smog-like smoke, here comes this great swarm. Now the big question is this, are these ordinary literal locusts? I think you'll see that they're not. But John is describing the vision a step at a time as he gradually receives it himself. And at the moment they appear in the distance to be a great swarm of locusts. He knows only too well what it is to see a cloud of real locusts descending from the sky, almost blotting out the sun, landing upon a fertile stretch of land, and when they eventually rise up into the air and fly away, to see the devastation left behind, so that not even a leaf, not even a leaf remains. But let's do what John did and look a little closer. Notice their detention and its length. Their detention and its length. These creatures from the abyss have been released from the place where demons go by the fallen angel. So we can see that they have been deliberately held captive. They have been imprisoned in darkness for a long period of time. And because of the fact that the fallen angel had come to the earth to release them indicates that they themselves must have, of necessity, came to earth a long time ago. Otherwise, how could he release them from the pit, the bottomless pit on the planet earth, if they didn't come to the earth themselves? A long time ago. Who are these locked up creatures that God has been reserving in darkness for this particular judgment? We have learned so much from Matthew chapter 24 about the tribulation period. Is there a clue to be found there? I believe there is. I'll just remind you of what it says for the sake of time in Matthew 24 verse 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Our Lord Jesus Christ is speaking here. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching the disciples here that history is going to repeat itself and that the conditions that prevailed on the earth in the lifetime of Noah 
would be the same conditions prevailing on the world scene just prior to the coming of the Son of Man to earth. That's the very period we're looking at here tonight in the book of the Revelation. It's all going to be reproduced. That's what the Lord's teaching them. Now, if we go back and look at the days of Noah just before the flood, we can remember that we are introduced to a fallen world. A fallen world. Verse 1 of Genesis chapter 6 says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. We see mankind multiplied. And today the population explosion is the biggest headache that our scientists have to face with six billion people on the planet. And it's booming every day. In verse 1, at the end of the verse, in verse 2, we read these words in Genesis 6. And daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they choose. Many maidens are being born here, but who are these mysterious marriers who are taking them wives of all which they choose in verse 2 and 4? Now, this isn't one wife each or anything like that. They're not getting down on their knee and proposing. There's no, they're just taking all the wives they want. We're looking at rampant polygamy here. The godless majority, even today, have ditched marriage. And they're just moving in with each other to live together, though the so-called marriage is not legally binding, so they can walk off in three months, three years, or even 30 years. There's nothing that says they have to stay or get a divorce or anything like that. They have just shacked up together, as we say here in Northern Ireland. Others are coming in to our land from other countries and other religions, like Muslims and uh, others, and they have many wives and children, according to their own customs. And they receive welfare, and they receive houses, and they receive benefits. Now that this has become socially and governmentally acceptable, some are bringing in a few more wives into the house. That's what's happening. In the Daily Mail yesterday, and yesterday, by the way, was the 20th of January, 09, a self-proclaimed rabbi says that God told him he was an Old Testament king. So he left his job, he left his wife, he, got, he divorced his wife, and and he said that God told him he should increase the size of his family at present. He has seven wives and a mother-in-law and ten children living over in England. And they're being paid £800 a month for child benefit alone. Now, how long do you think it'll be before Joe Bloggs in Northern Ireland or anywhere else follows suit? If these Muslims can have as many wives as they want and they get the benefits, if, if, if these uh, rabbis or this self-proclaimed uh, rabbi can do it and get the benefits, sure, I'll not just shack up. Well, one, I'll shack up with ten. Think of the children we could have and the benefit. You understand what I'm saying? If, if the government of any land leaves the word of God, they're heading for destruction every time. Verse 4 of Genesis 6 says this, There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. What's so strange about that? Well, it is strange. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. In verses 5 to verse 8, we read, and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he'd made man in the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. 
And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. This is God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's saying here, I'm so grieved in my heart, I'm going to just blot them out. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Anyone that's ever been saved, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New, they've been saved by grace. There's no other way to get saved. Who are these sons of God? The oldest Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint says the angels of God. And Job chapter 1 and 2 I'll say that again because it's not Job chapter 1 verse 2, but Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2 would certainly show that the expression sons of God is used for angels. And then in Job 38 and 7 we read, when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy, it couldn't be men because they weren't there yet. Also, the Hebrew word for giants here in Genesis 6 and verse 4 is Nephilim, which means fallen ones, from the root word Nephal, meaning to fall. Now, I know the argument about the saintly sons of Seth, and if I had an extra hour tonight, I believe I could go into it with you and I could prove that these are fallen angels followers of Satan, giants of evil, marauding monsters of evil who are just possessing the bodies of human beings right across the face of the earth. And what are they doing here? Why are they doing this? This is a satanically inspired invasion. The devil is behind the whole thing because he knows that immediately after Adam sinned, God had made a promise in Genesis 3 and 15, that the seed of the woman was going to bruise or crush his head one day. Now, I know there's an application to the nation of Israel here also, but this was the promise of a virgin birth. There was no man's seed going to be involved. It was the seed of the woman. You were born, I was born of our father's seed. But this was the promise of a virgin birth. No man's seed would be involved. And the devil knew that a demon-possessed woman could never bear the Messiah. And he's attempting to totally corrupt the entire human race as these demons cohabit with mortals. Now, I know that in heaven, angels do not procreate. They don't get married and have children. There's no wee baby angels or anything like that. But that's angels in heaven. When an angel falls from heaven, it becomes a demon. And it can possess people's bodies. And when a man is joined to a harlot, he's one with a harlot. And friend, we can see here that this is an attempt to totally corrupt the entire human race as these demons cohabit with mortals. Of course, he almost succeeded, and the problem with humanity was so tremendous, it was so great. It was like a a surgeon looking at a body with cancer in it. It had to be cut out. There was no other way. And so, God allowed the flood waters to gurgle down the throats and into the lungs of every breathing thing on earth, except for eight souls and a few animals in an ark. And Noah and his family found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and Noah was saved by grace. Obviously, you can't drown demons. The flood didn't drown those things. Fallen angels are demons. So where did these apostate angels come from and where did they go to? We're told in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell 
and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Peter expects us all to know exactly what he's talking about here in the days of Noah and the flood. Just listen to Jude, verse 6 and 7. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, now notice the similarity between their sins, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I was in a house one night and there was a film on the television and they said that an asteroid came down and it hit somewhere in Europe and then there was a backlash and it fell on Sodom and Gomorrah and that's what happened. God's word says it was eternal fire from the Lord out of heaven. Are you going to tell me an asteroid, an asteroid is eternal fire? If it was, it would still be burning. Do you know what they said in that program? There's no way from the Bible that anybody could possibly know what the sin of Sodom was. It's a pity of them, isn't it? They never read the Bible and they make films and preach sermons and all the rest of it, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. They're set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Friend, what does sodomy mean? Where does sodomy get its name in Sodom? Do you know what they say? It's in hospitality. In hospitality. That's what the sin of Sodom was. So make sure if anybody comes round Randallstown, make them a cup of tea. For you wouldn't want God sent the leg of that in Randallstown, would you? Don't talk daft, man. If you believe the stuff they're dishing up instead of God's word, then it's a pity. It really is. This was similar. It was in like manner in that both involved in apostasy and a lusting after strange flesh and a gross sexual immorality. So there was an illicit, unnatural union between these demonic creatures that had left their own principality and fell from their celestial position that God had put them in and the children of men, resulting in the birth of a race of wicked supernatural giants of evil with extraordinary powers. It may be here that men, mankind gets their Greek mythology from. I don't know. But this completely violated the God-ordained order of human marriage and procreation. Jude says that they're reserved, listen to it, in darkness. Peter says that God cast them down to hell. Tartaro is God's prison house for demons. Now in Revelation 9 verse 1 to 3, we're considering the judgment of the great day that Jude verse 6 is referring to. It's the judgment of God on Christ rejectors. It's not talking about the judgment of the sinning angels eventually. And they will be judged at the great white throne. Every being. I know that the translators have put every man, and it's in italic. It's every being that's being judged at the great white throne. But it's not talking here about the judgment on these sinning angels. It's talking about the judgment of God on these Christ rejectors. In Revelation chapter 9, God has them reserved in chains and in darkness in the bottomless pit waiting. And here's John seeing them coming out. Okay, so we see their detention and its length. We see that they have been detained there for a long time. Let's see their direction and their leader in verse 4 and 5 of chapter 9 of Revelation. 
And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. These creatures from the pit are able to receive orders from a superior. And they're highly organized, and they're obedient, and they're well-disciplined. Watch carefully the three limitations that they must observe. Don't do what is perfectly natural for locusts to do. You're not to touch the trees. You're not to touch the grass. You're not to touch any green thing. Sure, that's what locusts do. But these are unnatural locusts. Secondly, don't dare touch the sealed servants of God. Now, they must have the intelligence to be able to differentiate between those that are sealed and those that are not. And thirdly, don't take life, but torment men and women for a five-month period. You'll notice that at all times, even in the middle of the tribulation period, when hell is let loose on the face of the earth, God is still on the throne. I want you to see that. He never relinquishes his sovereignty. He draws the line as he did in the life of Job, and no evil power dare step over it. And the fact that God is measuring and limiting and under control is seen in the limitation of the five months, and no life is to be taken. And a third of men is being specified. Five is the number of God's grace. And even at this time, God would forgive as the heat is turned up if only men would repent. That's what we're seeing here. God is merciful, even at a time like this. In the tribulation period, it will be seen, it will be manifested. Remember in Romans 8 and 28, all things work together for good to them that love God to them that are the called according to his purpose. God can even make demons to serve his divine purposes. He can make the wrath of man to praise him. Aye, but they have a leader here that we need to see. In verse 11, I'll read it to you, and I quote, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. His name is given in Hebrew and in Greek because the judgment will come on both Jew and Gentile alike. Destroyer is the translation of both words. The destroyer. Now this is not the God of the demons. Satan is their God with a small g. This is their king. I want you to notice that. Proverbs 30 and verse 27 states, and I'll quote it to you, the locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. The locusts have no king. Do you still think these are literal locusts? You see, they have a king. Now, we have seen their detention and its length and their direction and their leader. Now look at their description and their looks as John zooms in on them in verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto, notice that terminology, like unto horses. They weren't horses. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses, prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, there's that symbolic talk again, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. You see, when we read in verse 7, they were like unto, it's symbolic, it means that you haven't to understand them in the literal sense. They're shaped like horses prepared unto battle. They have been chained in darkness for so long, waiting, desiring to be let loose even again for a moment, craving satisfaction like a hungry lion let loose, every one of them. And like horses, 
straining at the leash, pawing at the ground, rising up on hind legs, charging into battle, strong yet swift, crowned, their conquerors, powerful conquerors, invincible. Nothing can stop them. Faces of men, highly intelligent. Verse 8 says, And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. What a combination. Hair like women's. Is this a reference to the color or the texture of their hair? Of course not. Women's hair and men's hair have the same colors, the same texture. It's the length of it. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. We're told in 1 Corinthians 11 and 14. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. We're told in 1 Corinthians 11 and 15. There's a seductive attractiveness about these evil beings. Men turn away from the truth for seducing spirits and doctrines of demons because false doctrine has something fascinating about it. But these creatures that have tails like scorpions with stings in them, it's not the first appearance that torments men, but the after part, the oppression, the darkness, the poisoned mind, the broken heart, the screaming kids, it's always the innocent that get hurt. Listen, be careful of the things that you're playing about with. Men might call it gay. Look at the other end of it and tell me how that's gay. My friend, listen. The 144,000 have no problem because these creatures have no attraction for them. So they'll never be stung. They're gripped by the power of a greater attraction for their wonderful Lord Jesus. Verse 8 says, Their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Once these teeth grip and enter their prey, struggle is useless. They're fastened and tear and bite their victims till they're dead. Verse 9, at the beginning of the verse says, And they had breastplates, as it were, of iron. They can't be killed. They're totally insensitive to feelings of pity or mercy or heart. They're heartless horrors from hell, friend. Verse 9 at the end of the verse says, And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. They have wings, so they can't be outrun. There will be no place to hide on that day. Now we've seen, as we have looked at the apostasy of the angel, a fallen star, a vile smoke, a fiendish swarm. And now we see a frightening sting in verse 10. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Verse 3 at the end of the verse says, And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And in verse 5 we read, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented, listen to it, tormented, five months, and their torment, there it is again, was as the torment, there it is again, of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Let me tell you, as I look back over my ungodly life before I came to the Savior, torment is an awful, awful, awful thing that I didn't realize existed until it gripped me. The Word of God says, fear hath torment. People out there, friend, are tormented. Make no mistake about it. They might put them on the odds with their drinks click, clicking and, and, and all the laughter and fun and everything else, I'll tell you. When they go home at night, they're tormented. Tormented. The scorpion is part to sting and so have these Heartless horrors. That's the only thing I can call them. Heartless horrors from hell. And they can strike the victim and enter the body, releasing their venom and power into that screaming form that they're taking possession of. The spirit of these beings have a character that's evil, tormenting men and women, striking them, poisoning minds. They have the ability to kill 
if they're not restrained. Yet these inhuman tormentors have an insatiable hunger for humans, just as the locusts have for vegetation. And their prey will desire death as an option to their tormented existence in the false hope of relief. If you're thinking of committing suicide, let me tell you, it's going to be out of the proverbial frying pan and into the fire. What you're going through just now is a picnic compared to what you're going to launch yourself into. Turn to Christ. You must be born again. You can have a brand new life that you never had before. You don't have to put up with that old one. But don't kill yourself, friend. We see here an insane, suicidal, sinful world. Everybody trying to commit suicide. You see, their desire and yearning for death will be denied them because they'll not be free to exercise their own will. They'll not be able to die. These people have a belief, a false hope, that if they were only dead, they'd be able to get away from this. Verse 6 says, And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to to die, and death shall flee from them. Just imagine the poor, tormented horrors that will stalk our streets here for five months unable to die. The streets all over the world, friend. Maybe your neighbors. Maybe your friends. If the Lord comes as soon as we think he's going to come, the tribulation period starts right away, and it only lasts seven years. We're in the ninth year from the millennium changed. And it only seems like a couple of years ago. Here we have these people, friend, unable to die after plunging knives into their bodies, burning themselves with fire, throwing themselves into rivers that refuse to drown them. The mind boggles as it tries to grasp what this alone could mean. Maybe you can't understand it. Well, when you go home or you who are at home, it's lovely to see you and we thank you for watching and for listening If you study Matthew 17, verse 14 to 18, we see a child there who keeps throwing himself into the fire, but he didn't die. And his father said to the Lord, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. Man, he didn't burn, he didn't drown. Also in Mark chapter 5 and verse 5, the demoniac The naked demoniac, full of a legion of demons, was taking those sharp stones, and they're all over the place there. At Gadara, I brought one home to show anybody that wants to see it. They're like lances. And this man's taking these and running them down his face and down his jugular vein and down his body and legs, and he's cutting himself with stones. He wants to die. I have met men like this. And the demons are telling them, if you cut yourself open, we'll get out and you'll be free. I have met them. And they've sliced and sliced and sliced themselves, but they didn't get free. But they didn't die. Because these things that have entered their body don't want to be disembodied again. They want to stay there. But that man... Although he was naked, he didn't die of exposure. Although he was cutting himself all over his body, cutting his veins, yet he didn't die. And whenever these so-called locusts enter the body of their captives, the intolerable anguish and torment of body, mind, and soul is almost beyond endurance. There will be a desolation of humanity such as never has been known before. Up until now, we've been looking at grass and the sea and the sky and the sun and the moon and natural things. We're crossing a line here. And this is what happens. Friend, once the wall of man's soul is fallen as a consequence of willful, deliberate sin against God, then any diabolical wild beast that happens to be passing can come in. I know all about that. 
and the practice of witchcraft and, and all these other things can't help you. The devil gets you down, he'll put the boot in, I'm telling you. As a world of Christ rejectors scream for death in every city, town, and village in the world, but can't die, hell on earth will be a reality. The world is being prepared every day for the strong delusion and the exaltation of the beast, the antichrist, the lie, as the enemy of our souls is getting mankind ready for the beast's footstool. Even as we speak, this world is being brainwashed by literature on demonism and the occult and witchcraft and black magic and spiritism and ghosts. Even our babies are being fed by their parents on Harry Potter. And the woman that wrote the books gave a load of money to the government and now there's members of parliament saying that witchcraft should be taught in every school to the children while they're young. People are, are watching on, on film and on TV channels as werewolves and vampires and horror stories and exorcism take the lead. Even the police are turning more and more to soothsayers and mediums and fortune tellers and astrologers to find help and clues in some of their murder cases. The groundwork is being led and man is being preconditioned to receive seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Allow me to read to you Deuteronomy 18 verse 10 to 12 where communication with the spirit world is forbidden by God. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire. That's child sacrifice. Or that useth divination, that's a soothsayer, or an observer of times, that's astrology, or an enchanter, that's a sorcerer, or a witch, that's witchcraft, black magic, or a charmer, and we all know what charms are in the country, or a consulter with familiar spirits, that's a medium, or a wizard, that's one who conjures spells, or a necromancer, that's one who tries to raise the dead, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. Now, I took time with that because some of you are sitting thinking, well, I would never have anything to do with those things. Is that right? Yet, do you not realize that you're joining in with these evil spirits whenever you're watching a seance on your television? And they're all sitting holding hands and they're saying, show yourself if you're there. And they're crying out, come on, Satan, show yourself. And it's in your house and you're in it, whether you like it or whether you don't. Demons are not confined to TV sets. Don't talk nonsense. And friend, I'll tell you, I have an advertisement that was given to me last week that was in the TV Times just recently. Here's what it says. Night three, lost souls, living, most haunted life, the search for evil, tonight from 8 p.m. And there were people glued to their TV sets, the search for evil. They're calling up the dead friend. God hates it, I tell you. And you're sitting with it all in your home. And you don't even realize you're bringing evil spirits into your home as they call up the dead to show themselves. Listen, one of the 11 souls that was saved recently in our meetings was watching that program. And she insisted to me that something evil had entered into her house and was ruining her life ever since. She says, every day, my life is ruined. Praise the Lord. She called on the Lord Jesus for salvation. And the devil had to leave. When Christ comes in, the devil gets out. Now, we've seen the apostasy of the angels, the domination of the demons, and watch quickly the hostility of the horsemen here. Verse 12 to 14, One woe is past, and behold, there cometh two wars, woes more hereafter. 
the three woe judgments are actually synonymous with the last three of the seven trumpet judgments. Verse 13 says, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And the voice of intercession at the altar shows us that what is about to happen is an answer to prayers for vengeance. We saw that last week. Verse 14 saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now that's a special place mentioned. That's a geographical position. We can pinpoint the river Euphrates, the river that separates east and west, the dividing line, one of the four rivers that watered the Garden of Eden. Satan was there in the time of Adam and Eve, and the fall took place there, and the first murder, and the first grave, and it was here that the Jews were exiled, and Babylon arose, and it's to be the eastern boundary of the promised land in a future day. It was included in territory belonging to the four great world powers in Scripture, and there are four angels there, and they're bound. Are these four fallen angels well, the holy elect angels of God are never said to be bound. Are they the princes mentioned in Daniel 10, verse 13, and verse 20 to 21, who controlled the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire, for Satan in time past, and kept them under the dominion of the false god of this world? All the world powers of the Bible are associated with the Euphrates. Well, I don't honestly know whether they are those great princes that resisted God's angel getting through to Daniel. I don't know. They may be barriers that are holding back the East from invading the West. For in 1965, China boasted an army of 200 million, the same number that's mentioned here. One thing is sure. They are of great and influential power because the moment they're released, they're able to marshal an army of millions. Listen to verse 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. John heard the number. 200 million of them. But there's a special period mentioned here. And it should say the hour, the day, the month, the year. I'm told that's the best translation. It's not 13 months in a day. What's being said is they have been held till this very moment. Verse 17 says, And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as heads of lands, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three was the third part of men killed. By what three? By the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents, and they had heads, and with them they do hurt. Are these creatures from earth or hell? Maybe both, friend. The riders in this cavalry from hell are demonic destructive powers, and it's the horses themselves that are the active agents in this slaughter. But whatever they are, they're responsible for the highest casualty report the world has ever known. 850 million to 1 billion wiped out. Remember in Revelation 6 and verse 8, a quarter of the earth's inhabitants were wiped out already, and now another third of what remains is gone. I'm not taking time with it, but when you go home, read Joel chapter 2, verse 1 to 14. And you'll see why I'm saying that God, praise Him, is merciful. But will they repent? Listen to verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk, they repented, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, 
nor of their theft. You can see the state of society there. You can do all the evil you like, and nobody will touch you in those days. Do good, and they'll take the head off you. You can see the hardening of their hearts. After all this, they don't repent, for like Pharaoh, God's judgments didn't heart, didn't soften their hearts, but hardened them. Purgatory's no use. Maybe you think at times when you read the Lord saying, Woe unto you, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. Maybe he's a bit quick off the mark. Maybe they just needed a little more time. They were already over the deadline, friend. They were already over the deadline. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11 talks about their hearts are fully set in them to do evil. Fully set. Like concrete. Like stone. To do evil. Now, although a supernatural conception of the daughters of men produced a race of monstrosities called giants, nevertheless, as we have already seen in verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man, and in verse 12, all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. It wasn't the angels. God sent the flood because of the wickedness of men. Can I say this because I think it needs to be said? So many prophecies in God's word has, have already been fulfilled. But always remember when reading the prophetic scriptures that have not yet been fulfilled, we're studying history in advance. And many of the issues involved are beyond our present capacity to understand and will not become clear until they actually happen. Matthew 24, verse 15, our Lord Jesus Christ says that those that read, let them understand. The application of some prophetic scriptures is not obvious until they're fulfilled. How would the people of 100 years ago know anything about computers or microchips or satellite television or anything else? They wouldn't. We can only read it because God wants us to keep this book open and study it and hold it in our hearts because God has promised us a threefold blessing if we'll do that.